Hello, welcome. My name is Shannon Kreider, and I'm the Director of Education for Houston Center for Photography, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to HCP's Collecting Photography, How to Grow Your Art Collection via Auctions with Phillips Auctioneer, Sarah Kruger. For those of you who are new to HCP, Houston Center for Photography is a nonprofit photo gallery, educational space, and publisher of Spot Magazine based in Houston, Texas. This program is part of our series leading up to our virtual print auction and 40th anniversary celebration. This series uh, next program is a guided tour with the esteemed Ann Tucker for our sponsor level ticket buyer. She's going to do a walkthrough of the exhibition. Our live auction celebrating our 48 years of, at HCP is on Thursday, February 18th, and there's still time to register. And we're going to drop in a link into the chat. Um, so if you haven't registered, you can get all the information you need about the auction at HCP online slash print dash auction. The, bid the bidding begins on February 4th. Uh, for both the live and silent auction. And to participate in the bidding, you must first register on Artsy and all that information is online. Um, and if you miss out on the live bidding on February 18th, the silent auction will go until 4 p.m. Central on February 19th. So check out our website for more information. We hope to see you and have you participate. The auction exhibition is on view at HCP and our so you can visit us during our regular gallery hours. Admission is free, but please register beforehand and wear a face mask. And if you aren't able to make it to the gallery, the online exhibition and catalog are available on our website. So a few housekeeping uh, notes before we get started. If you haven't already, please mute yourself. Um, there's a microphone icon in the left-hand corner of your screen. And if you have any questions for Sarah, you can send me, Shannon Kreider, a message. I'll be sharing questions with the, from the audience with Sarah throughout the program and during our Q&A at the end of her talk. With over a decade of experience at Phillips, Sarah Kruger has been instrumental in working with collectors to research, source, and evaluate property for auction, as well as developing sales strategies for high value lots. As one of Phillips' most tenured auctioneers, Sarah consistently takes the rostrum for sales across categories in New York and London. She serves as the primary photographs auctioneer in New York. Notably, in April 2019, she hammered down the gavel at 1.8 million to achieve a new world auction record for the acclaimed photographer Helmut Newton. In 2017, she conducted the auctions for a prestigious private collection assembled by late financier and pioneering New York-based collector Howard Stein. The Odyssey of Collecting photographs from Joy of Giving Something Foundation, which achieved over $10 million in sales. Sarah also donates her time as a benefits auctioneer for numerous nonprofit organizations that span the United States, including Houston Center for Photography. She joined the Photographs Department in 2007 and holds a master's degree from New York University. So without further ado, please join me in virtual applause for Sarah Kruger. This is it's hard. Okay, I, I, I feel it. Thank you so much <laughs> for that, that generous welcome tonight. Um, you know, it's a real pleasure being with you all. I get to talk about my favorite things. So I get to talk about photographs, I get to talk about auction, and I get to talk about collecting. So Shannon's um, going to be with me in this. Um, I have a deck of some images that I'll be sharing and some notes as we go through the talk. As she mentioned, you are more than welcome to submit questions as we go through the evening. I, I open um, uh, you know, the platform to you as well to have this be engaging and look forward to addressing any questions you may have. So when I think about collecting and I think about auction and I think about photographs, I actually think a lot about how it's a personal journey. And so one of the images that I like starting with when I talk about collecting photographs is actually not an image from an auction. It's not a $1.8 million photograph. Instead, it's a family photograph. And so we'll see if we can get that up and it's to remind us all 
that we are all collectors of images. I know that there are probably some very seasoned collectors out there with us tonight. I imagine there are some new collectors and some aspiring collectors there too. I hope you all get something out of this. And you know, again, we have images. We have images on our phone. We have prints. We have photographs, maybe in shoe boxes and basements. Um, we have family photos. We have albums. And you know, with photography, because it's a medium, you know, that of art that we relate to through our everyday lives. I think when we think about collecting, there's so much of the photographer and the way they see that we can relate to how we see. And so here, you know, my family photo makes me think of New York. It makes me think of family memories. And then we'll kind of, Shannon, jump to the next slide. You know, at Phillips, you know, we've had the pleasure of working with Nicholas Nixon's work. Um, and we'll pull up the grid. I know that at Museum of Fine Arts Houston, uh, there is the entire series and I hear that for 2020, they even did a Zoom portrait. So hopefully that's something that will be unveiled soon for you all to enjoy in Houston. But here's Nicholas Nixon, you know, iconic series, um, documenting family, documenting relationships, giving a sense of place, of time, of, of aging, of experience. And you know, another image that I want to share, you know, Tomas Struth. Um, here we have a sense of place, you know, how do we relate to this? Thomas Struth, German, Dusseldorf school, you know, taking these images on urban street scenes and looking out to the towers, 1978. And each one of these images, I'm very proud to say, um, at, you know, have come through auctions at Phillips. And this is where auction and collecting, you know, can create the opportunity and really open the door for discovery. Because outside of museum exhibitions and survey exhibition, in no other place can you really get the history of a medium, you know, kind of in one moment and all different genres. So as we talk tonight, um, you know, we can jump, I think, just to the next slide that gives a little visual. Oh, the, I should have mentioned, yes. So one of the other things that um, you know, I relate to with photographs is I studied in Chicago. And um, so the Institute of Design School is one that I personally love. Um, you know, again, it's something that I relate to. Um, so I, I challenge you all to think about what you might relate to, what you've seen in art that you might not relate to and that might challenge you and how you can think about that with collecting. As I mentioned, uh, and I skipped ahead a little bit, but you know, auction, we can jump to the next slide. You know, auction provides the opportunity through viewings um, where you're really getting an entire survey of so many different uh, types of photographs, um, everything from 19th, 20th, 21st century working photographers all in one place. And so for those of you who are more experienced in collecting or someone who's getting started, auction can provide an education and then also the opportunity to just see and experience different things and learn more about what you're attracted to and what you aren't. And so tonight we get to really delve deep into all of those things. And what it starts with are really the fundamentals. And so we'll, we'll skip ahead here, Shannon, and kind of, you know, talk through what it means to collect photographs, because photographs, you know, by their nature are works on paper. Um, we are caretakers of them when we're collectors. And I think it's really important, especially when you're buying from auction to understand what it is that you're getting. And in skipping ahead, you know, there are certain things to educate yourself on, you know, as you're collecting, you know, it can be print type, print date, print date, excuse me, edition, condition, and, you know, knowing what resources are out there for you. The first thing that people really encounter when it comes to auction is absolutely the catalog entry. We slave over these entries when we put together our auction catalogs and try and give you the most research possible. And so you have the image of the work, artist, title, description, and really just a snapshot 
of the physical characteristics in addition to the auction estimate. When you're looking at one of the entries, again, it's important to think about these prints as physical objects. And so on the next slide, you know, whereas on the entry, we just have a JPEG, it's thinking about these works as objects and learning about them as objects. And I think that really brings a lot of appreciation into the process. So here we have Richard Avedon. Uh, it is from his American West series. And when you're looking at it in the catalog, we're just seeing a JPEG, you know, but thinking about it like the, it's a physical object, you know, it's an oversized print laid on aluminum. You know, Avedon is one of these great photographers who has a magnificent signature. So we have this sweeping Avedon signature on the back. And it's really getting to know the object in addition to the image. And so I like sharing this image of the reverse of the work. And then we'll get in a little bit closer even with the next one. You'll see uh, terms related to recto, so being the front, verso being the back. Um, you know, here we have close up of the signature and the addition number and also stamps. And, you know, Avedon's one of those great photographers who gives you essentially all the information you might want on the back of a print. Um, for those of you who have, you know, been lucky to see the reverse of a work by Irving Penn, he's another one of those photographers that gives you everything you want to know on the back of his prints. Some photographers will not. Uh, but this is a great example, again, of someone who does. And so Avedon's given us a stamp on the back of the aluminum you know, with title, date, series, you know, kind of where and how it was printed. And when it comes to, you know, not just thinking about, you know, collecting and thinking about the images you like, you know, and then how it translates into those physical characteristics. So this being an oversized print, it's also making sure that you're doing your own due diligence and kind of protecting yourself and your investment. You know, this is a photograph that has a value of tens of thousands of dollars. And you want to know if it's signed. Is it stamped? Is it numbered? What is uh, going to be specific to any one photographer? And so with Avedon, we know we always want his work signed. And I would say, if you're looking to buy a print, one of the first questions you should ask is, is it signed? And if it's not signed, you know, should it be? What is what is accurate to that photographer's work? And so we'll go back to the install just because I love I love that one shot. You know, the Peggy Daniels American West image. Again, this is one that we were you know fortunate to have in an auction at Phillips. But in thinking about how you know, if you're interested in auction, you know, there's a few different ways that you can approach and engage. You know, there's the first step, you know, looking at the catalog, what speaks to you, maybe it's this image. So then you read the description and you're learning about the signature and you might ask a specialist like myself, hey, can I see images of the signature? Is that what's going to be right for this work? Should it have additional information, an additional certificate? And having that conversation, getting the additional images, and then seeing it in person. And one of the things that I think is really actually kind of fabulous about what we're doing right now that has been an exciting development in COVID times is, you know, previously, I'd say, you know, to experience an auction viewing, it would be traveling to New York. You know, if you went to experience the HCP viewing for the auction, it might be showing up at HCP. But now there are so many ways to engage digitally. And so I have the image of the install. You know what I'm saying? Ask about an in-person viewing or even a remote viewing. We are embracing FaceTime and Zoom and video and tours to really show people the works of art as they are as these beautiful physical objects, you know, without having to show up and be in person. And so there's just a lot of ways that you can see and engage. And if it's your first time at auction, you know, looking at that JPEG, learning more about it, but then also finding an opportunity to see what that physical object is like on the wall before you, if you're lucky enough, end up with it in your collection. Sarah, we have a question from the audience about yeah, uh, photographs being mounted. 
Absolutely. Uh, can okay. You speak to that? Yes. So mounting, I would say like signatures and stamps, uh, the first question is what is going to be um, consistent with the artist practice? Um, with Avedon and with the American West series, you know, this is something where the entire series was laid on aluminum at this scale. And so you want exactly what we're presenting. You would not want as a collector an unmounted unsigned print. That's just not something that would be a smart investment for for you because you might run into issues with resale later you know now let's do another example um let's say that we're looking at um an irving pen and we're looking at um maybe one of his pigment print flowers now those prints um, or dye transfer flowers, those prints are not usually mounted. And so if you were looking at a dye transfer Irving pen flower and considering that for your collection and it's mounted on foam core, that should maybe signal alarm bells, you know, because that is not what is consistent to pens practice. So did a collector lay it down on foam core at some point with a poor framing decision? Um, we've all been there, we've all seen them, I'm sure. Or is it on foam core because it was a print that was printed for exhibition? And so mounting, I think that there is no um, kind of clear way to say mounting is good or bad. You know, with a lot of things with collecting, uh, it's what's going to be consistent to the artist and to the work, and how does that relate to the condition? And you can always have those conversations. You know, I have so many of those conversations when it comes to our auction previews, and you know, you can ask you know, specialists like myself when it does come to auction. You know, or if you're working, you know, with a gallery, um, they're experts as well, and they're going to be able to tell you what's consistent within the edition of that photographer's work. Great. Um, I will add on to that. I would never mount things that you've collected unless you've spoken with the artist or the artist gallery. So keep that in mind too when you're making your own framing decisions. And, you know, the next thing that I want to get into, and it's interesting, you know, coming from the mounting question, you know, into what's up next with our Eggleston tricycle is talking about condition. You know, and I highlighted some of that just now when we were talking about, you know, why would that Irene pen be on foam core? You know, should that Avedon be on aluminum? You know, this William Eggleston, um, I hope is a familiar image to many of you. It is certainly an iconic image by the artist. And I love having this as an example because, you know, at Phillips, there are a few prints that I've worked with that are just absolute treasures. For me, this print of the tricycle was one of them because it was in excellent condition. So we're going to look at a few images um, of that and kind of talk about some terms that you might see when it comes to discussion of condition. So we'll jump ahead to the next slide. And when you're thinking about condition of prints, mounting definitely should be one of those questions. So we've already talked about that and what's going to be consistent with, with anyone's work or with an artist's work. There's also going to be sheen. Does the paper have margins? What do the colors look like? With auction purchases, there's something that's called a condition report for each print that we offer for public sale. And you'll see terms, um, you know, again, that relate to these physical characteristics and the print quality. Here we have a dye transfer print by Eggleston. I still think it's just an absolute treat even looking at the unframed images of this. So a dye transfer print process is a color printing process that Eggleston really was at the forefront of developing, um, you know, kind of one of these uh, uh, fathers of the color photography process. It was something that was very much used more in the advertising world as opposed to the fine art world when he started using it to make his prints. And it's known for these really vibrant, saturated colors and also the longevity of which the, the colors stay within the print itself. This print of the tricycle was again an 
excellent condition. And even just looking at this unframed JPEG, you get a sense of that sheen. So like it has this magnificent semi-gloss sheen. There's no rippling in the surface. You're getting nice, saturated, vibrant colors, which is what you want to see that relates to the process. So what is the print? How does it look? And is that accurate to what it is? And in this print, we're getting everything. Um, and so just in those details, you get, you get a sense of it. And again, a sense of the physical object, which is so important when you're thinking about collecting photographs. There's also, you know, what I like to talk about with condition is condition and context. Not every print is meant to be in pristine condition. You, we might have an artist um, who likes to crumple up sheets of paper, expose it to light, and then flatten them. We've offered artists like that in our sales at Phillips. And so should this print be in good condition? And this block is such a wonderful example of that. Um, it's one of the Storyville pictures. Later prints of the image um, are out there, and those are in very good condition. But this is a somewhat earlier print of the image, and it was used for publication. And so let's look at the images that we have that are, are close-ups of the print itself. So now, in looking at the recto, this is obviously a print that has been handled. We have labels on the back. We have handwriting on the back. We have notes on how it was used on the back. And this is the history of the object. Because this print was used, it was never going to be in excellent condition if it's something that's authentic to what it is. So as you're collecting, you might not always have every object in excellent condition. You know, that, that tricycle, if you're thinking about having it in your collection, absolutely. If you can get one in excellent condition, that would be amazing. For this print here, it's more about the object. It's more about how it was used. And so it's the condition and context of what it is rather than what you might think it should be. And so that's something that I like to mention. These are two very extreme examples. But it's important because when you're looking at a condition report, so something that we provide pre-sale, not everything is going to be in excellent condition. Um, and so it's just kind of finding out why there might be condition issues and learning from that. Now, oh, and here, just to kind of go over some terminology, we often get questions of, you know, how do you see things? And when, photographs and condition of photographs is very much a visual thing. When it comes to those written reports, it's actually kind of tricky. You know, like how do we tell someone, yes, it's there, but this isn't necessarily, you know, something that's going to detract from the image quality. Or, you know, in this case, like it is there, we wanna make sure you know it's there because we don't want you to be disappointed if you see it later. And so raking light is a term that you'll see come up very frequently uh, when it comes to condition of photographs, um, and especially when it comes to our condition reports at Phillips. And raking light is when you're holding a harsh light source you know, directly down on the paper and kind of raking the paper underneath to see what's going on in the surface. So here, you know, again, we're still looking at the block. You can see there, there aberrations on the surface. It's a hairline crack, so it's actually a crack in the paper itself. And we're seeing it under that harsh light source. You know, handling marks and creases, those are also terms that you'll see on a condition report. And that's just, you know, if someone was handling a print and, you know, just kind of presses in a little bit too much, it might not show up right away, but that can cause a handling mark um, uh, or crease or a hairline crack. And so these are words that you'll see to kind of describe what's going on visually with the print. Then next up, just to kind of layer in on our conversation on condition is what's a condition issue versus something that's just inherent to a printing process. 
And so here we have one of Cartier Bresson's iconic images in France, um, you know, certainly capturing his aesthetic of the decisive moment. And Cartier Bresson on his prints is someone who used an immense amount of retouching. So we have the recto image. So this is the work on framed. The print does have a beautiful signature. So I like just showing that for the Cartier Bresson. And then we'll jump to the next slide. And now we're gonna talk about retouching. So photographs, anyone who has been in a dark room um, and printed a photograph uh, using traditional darkroom practices knows that you're dealing with chemicals, you are dealing with light, you are dealing with exposure, and you might be dealing with dust. You might be dealing with scratches on the negative that you're exposing to your light sensitive paper. Retouching is something that's an in-painting process on top of the photograph that's done at the time of printing. And so if you look very closely at the image that's on the left, there's kind of like this dull spot that doesn't have as much sheen as elsewhere in the image. That's simply where it's been in-painted to cover up an imperfection. So on a condition report, especially for Cartier Bresson's work, you might see something listed where there's a lot of retouching. And so it's knowing that rather than that being a condition issue, it's going to be a physical characteristic of the work and understanding the difference between that and maybe seeing a Cartier Bresson print that has a lot of handling marks, um, creases, some of those marks that we saw in the block print. A Cartier Bresson, you know, something printed for the market signed off by the artist should be in excellent condition. The retouching being a physical characteristic of it. A lot of handling marks, creases, marks, scratches, you know, would not be something that would be that best example of the work that you would want to collect and bring into your, con your collection. Um, so understanding what's going on on the paper and understanding you know, the condition of these objects themselves is important in terms of making decisions on which print you might wanna purchase. Photographs are a medium of multiples. Yes, you will have unique works. Um, yes, there are always going to be rarities and special things, but for the tricycle, for example, or this image of a Cartier Bresson, you would want to have something in your collection that's of a high caliber of condition, again, to protect your investment in these objects, as opposed to something that has a lot of handling marks. The block, it's just the history of the work. So it's educating yourself, making sure that you always ask for a condition report at auction and asking questions on anything that's unclear. But this gives you a little kind of brief snippet um, you know, of some information that might be helpful to you in the future if you are reading one of our reports. And I think next up, so this is what a condition report looks like. We've been talking about them so much. As I mentioned, you know, each work that comes up to auction does have a condition report. Uh, it's something that we produce, um, which I think is especially important in this environment when people are engaging with us remotely, that gives a, a snapshot of the condition of those physical characteristics. So here we have the Cartier Bresson, you know, the first sentence just kind of tells you what it is. So this is a neutral tone print. It's on semi-gloss paper that has a double weight and it has margins. So now we know what kind of paper we're dealing with. Then the second sentence of the report will tell you about the condition. And so here we're saying extremely light minor re retouching visible only under raking light. So that's the in painting and only visible under a harsh light. And since now you're completely educated on retouching, you know, if you weren't before, you know that that's just something that would have been done at the printing process. No other surface aberrations visible. Great, this print is in excellent condition. It's exactly what you would expect of Cartier Bresson, you know, and should feel comfortable bidding on for sale. And again, the condition reports, there's something that you can request from a specialist. Um, also for our sales at Phillips, they're fully visible online as well. Now the fun stuff, 
So we've talked about condition, we've talked about some terminology, auction and discovery. I, as I mentioned earlier, I think there is no better way to learn about any medium of art than to walk into an auction preview. You're going to see a history of a medium. You are going to see good, better, and best examples of various prints and various artists' work. And it's all there and it's all for sale. Um, and so we'll jump ahead just to the next slide here. What we're going to talk about, or what I'll show you here, is um, a video that we've done for Phillips that just talks about the different ways that you can participate with us, um, you know, both in person and remotely. And it just gives a nice overview in a really fun way of how you can bid and participate in auction. I'll mention it might be a little bit glitchy with the um, visual quality on your streaming, but the audio should be okay. And we also have a YouTube link that we'll be sending in the chat function that um, is where we have all of our videos. So you can peruse and, and view at your leisure you know, after the talk as well. Whether you're looking for art, photographs, design, editions, watches, or jewels, bidding online with Philips is easy to do. You can place a bid from anywhere in the world using our app or website. You can bid on our traditional auction room sales or on our online only sales. Once you create your account and log in, you can browse upcoming sales and keep track of your favorite lots. To participate in a live auction, register 24 hours before the start of the sale. For online only sales, you can register anytime before the close of the first lot. The countdown will tell you how much time is left before the auction closes. Our online only sales close on a rolling basis with each lot closing a minute apart. But if there's three minutes to go and a new bid comes in, we'll reset the closing time. You'll see your successful bids in the My Bids section and receive a confirmation once the auction closes. As always, our international team is here to answer Whether you're a savvy collector or an auction newcomer, whether you're home or on the go, Phillips is anywhere you go. All right, great. So it's, you know, I, I like showing that video because, you know, it, in thinking about auction, you know, there is a lot that has changed in our industry over the past year. Um, you know, digital has always been, you know, something at Philips that has been at the forefront of what we do. So I think that we were in really uniquely positioned, but it's also forced us to adapt. So live auctions are a little bit different when I'm auctioneering. And I, I wanted to share this image to just give context. You know, when you're watching at home, maybe watching our live stream of an auction, it might actually seem like it's the same, you know, but I'm auctioneering now in front of, of multiple screens. And so it's a little bit of a different environment. But the important thing is as a collector, the experience is the same. And I think um, more so than anything else, the accessibility is, is broadened. And I think that that's something that should be really exciting to anyone who's interested in participating in auction. And hopefully we will have many new bidders um, or bidders continuing to participate after this. Um, so for, for bidding, um, in-person bidding, you know, that is something that's on pause right now, um, at least for us at Phillips. Um, just for COVID protocol, but traditionally, yes, you could choose to be in the room bidding on a lot in person with me up on the podium or one of my colleagues. Now there's a term called absentee bidding. Absentee bidding might be uh, something that's good to use for a few different reasons. One, maybe you're a nervous bidder or you get swayed by emotion. I would say maybe absentee bidding is a good way to go so you don't get carried away. You're setting your maximum amount in advance of the sale. It is in my book as an auctioneer, and I will bid up to but not exceed that bid on your behalf. And we'll carry through an example of that um, in another few slides. There's bidding by telephone, so you can be on the phone with um, an agent in the auction room. This is something that we are still doing at Phillips. 
they'll be your eyes and ears of the process. And you'll be able to see exactly what's going on if you're following the live stream on your computer. And then also hear what's happening in the sale room. And just by saying yes, you'll be able to place a bid through your agent. Online live bidding, we are having such a global audience bidding online uh, since 2020 and before 2020, but even more so. And I think uh, many people are finding this as a, a substitute for being in person. And it, you're really on your computer, you're watching the live feed, you're clicking your mouse when you're ready to go with your bid, and that's gonna be the bid online. We also do it through iPhone, you can bid on an Android, you can bid on your computer, you can really, really bid anywhere. Advanced bidding is um, ultimately the same as an absentee bid, but you can register, register that through our website. With auction, I think it is important to understand terminology because then when you're listening on a lot that you might be bidding on, or just trying to understand how the flow of the sale is going, you can listen to the words of the auctioneer. I might say it's with my bidder, it's in my books. You know, oh, she's got an absentee bid. Let's see, you know, maybe I'll hold back on my bids to see how far she goes with her absentee bid. And so knowing the terms of the house and the terms of the auctioneer, it can help you decipher what you want to do when you're bidding on a lot as well, just by listening maybe to my words or the words of another auctioneer. So these are some of the terms that we use at Phillips and then also some of the many ways that you can participate in, in bidding with us. Now, the numbers. Believe it or not, when I am auctioneering, I am doing math. Um, I am doing a lot of math and I am keeping track of a lot of numbers. And if for, for you as you're bidding at auction or considering to bid at auction, I think it's really important for you to know and understand the numbers as well. So that way you're comfortable. Auction houses generally have set increments. And so that means within any different level of a bid, numbers will go up by a certain range. So let's say you're interested in bidding 7,800 on something. Well, that's actually going to be a split bid with Phillips, because if you look at where we are between 5,000 and 10,000, we'll go by 500 increments. So that would help you plan your bid amount because you would know, okay, well, I would have to budget 7,500 or 8,000 for my best chances of being successful on that lot. Likewise, you know, going through the different levels, it's just important to know what's going to be standard of the house. So that way you can plan accordingly with your bid amount, regardless of how you're participating. I would hate for someone to be bidding at a high level and not understand that a, the next bid might be 10,000, might be 20,000, might be 50,000, as opposed to 1,000. We always wanna make sure that we don't have those surprises because that can be a costly mistake. Also in terms of terminology, with auction, there's the hammer price and then the published price, which includes our buyer's premium. And this is also something to be aware of. The hammer price is always going to be the price where the gavel falls on the auction. So when I'm up there auctioneering and I'm closing a lot for 20,000 and I bring down my gavel, that's going to be the hammer's price. Buyer's premium is the commission that the house applies on top. It's usually around 25 or 26% for the houses. And that's going to be your total purchase price. And then you'll have shipping and taxes. As part of a pre-sale recommendation, ask what your all-in price might be. You know, if you're shipping to Houston from a New York sale and you're doing a hammer price of 20,000, we can always cost that out for you. What you should know as a collector is you know, budget for the hammer price, budget for the auction house premium, and make sure you're considering sales tax as well, depending upon where you are or where you're shipping. Now, the good thing about the HCP auction is when I will be up there for the live lots in another few weeks, is that there is no buyer's premium. And so while you would need to think about that while you're bidding with Phillips, when we're bidding for HCP, all you need to worry about is the hammer price. So we'll jump ahead. I thought it would be fun to go through just kind of what one lot would be like. 
So here is Sally Manns, um, Untitled from Deep South. Uh, Phillips was uh, uh, honored to be a sponsor of the Sally Mann exhibition when it was at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And uh, it was something that I saw, you know, actually when I was in Houston for, for one of the benefits. And so the Sally Mann is one that we offered in a previous auction. Uh, the numbers that are in front of us are an estimate of 15 to 25,000. And so we talked about an estimate range. We talked about a hammer price. We talked about buyer's premium. Another term to be aware of and think about is a reserve price. In most auctions, each work will have a reserve unless published that it is sold without reserve. And a reserve is generally an amount that's around the low estimate or within 80% of the low estimate. And that's going to be a confidential amount between us as the house and the seller of the object that essentially says, you know, by contract, we won't sell this work for less than whatever the reserve price is. Now, I think what's good for everyone to know with auction is because of certain regulations um, that came up in the late 90s, early 2000s, a reserve price may be no higher than the low estimate. So anytime you look at an estimate for a work that's being offered at public auction, you know that you can be successful if you bid 15,000. It kind of takes the guesswork out of it. So if you were interested in this work and wanted to bid, um, but only kind of bid up to where you felt you could be successful, 15,000 would be a solid bet because if there's no other competition, you could be successful at 15,000. And you know, you know, because of our talk tonight that the reserve price has to be no higher than 15,000 so you can be successful there. And then jumping ahead, now you guys can all think about if you would like, um, you know, what your bid amount would be. You have been through the terminology that I've shared with you about the words I use as an auctioneer and the different ways that I would bid. And so this is a video of me auctioneering that lot. And rather than just kind of uh, watching, you know, think about from what we've talked, where the bids are coming from. Are they coming from the room? Are they coming from the book? Are they coming from telephones? Where would you as a bidder want to jump in and how high would you go? And we'll see what ends up happening with the lot. Oh, and I'm not getting sound on my end, so I wonder if. Sorry about that. I muted because I had a sound issue. Here, here we go. All right, here we go. Number 242 is next. This is Sally Mann, the Deep South picture showing just to my right. And here it'll be. 12,000 to open and at 12,000, 13,000, 14,000, 15,000, gentlemen's bid in the room and at 15,000. It's with a gentleman seated at 15,000. Fair warning here. And last chance here phone bidder, Doug, at 15,000, 16,000, 17,000. Eighteen thousand, nineteen thousand, twenty thousand. For twenty thousand, then the bid is with Doug again at twenty thousand. Last chance to the sale room and selling. Sold twenty thousand. Total ten eighty three. Thank you. Great, so I hope some of you were successful with your bids. Um, what I like about sharing that example is there was someone in the room who was bidding. They came in at 15,000. If you were listening closely, I was not mentioning that I had any bids in my book. And so they placed a bid at 15,000 and if it had gone no further, they would have been successful. Now we had a telephone bidder that came in and the bids happened pretty fast. Um, you know, and it ultimately ended up selling for a higher price, but still within range. And as an auction specialist, if we're doing kind of our, the best job that we do by our seller 
and to inform our buyers, you know, the pre-sale range, the low estimate and that high estimate is really the best indicator of where it would sell. And so here it sold right in the middle at 20,000. So there we have the auction um, uh, and the auction process. And then just briefly, as we start to wrap up, you know, collecting is something that you can do. I, I really believe at any level. You know, in my introduction, yes, I hammered down a helmet Newton at $1.8 million. You can also buy his work for a few thousand dollars. You can buy vernacular images from an antique shop. You can buy emerging artists um, just by seeing someone you might like on Instagram. And when you're looking at auctions and looking at our auctions for certain images, there's a way to collect high and low. And so that's what we'll kind of go through next. So here we have Edward Weston, an early print of Dunes sold for us for over 300,000. A later print of the same image, 10,000. And so do you want to prioritize, you know, a really museum caliber early print of a work? You know, an early print, absolutely. Do you just love the image and want to have it and own it? You know, then there's an opportunity at a lower price just because it's a later print of the image. And then next up, we have another example of Sally Mann and collecting at any price level, but let's think about print size. So Sally Mann is someone who with her um, uh, early series, she printed in two different sizes, a 20 by 24 and an eight by 10 inch, and they've sold at different levels. So you know, if you want to have the scale, um, and have this like monumental, you know, print. Absolutely, go for it. Do you just love the image? Do you just want one of Sally Mann's pictures? You know, maybe look at the smaller eight by 10. And there's something wonderful about her eight by 10 inch photos because those are her contact prints. You know, she's using big, beautiful glass negatives and these are contact images. So the print itself at eight by 10, yes, it might be a lower price point, but it's kind of cool because you know that that's, that's your process. That's the size of your negative and the size of the print. And the next up, this is my extreme example. Um, William Eggleston, the dye transfer tricycle, which we sold at Phillips. So maybe you can't afford a tricycle, but I'd like to think that all of us could probably afford the book. Um, William Eggleston's guide is, is one of the most important photo books. Um, you can get a copy of it a later edition for $45 from Amazon tonight, if you're interested. And so as you're thinking about collecting images, whether it's auction, you know, whether it's gallery, whether it's HCP, you know, you can think about the image that you like or the artist you want to collect and what fits within your budget. And in terms of community, this is the opportunity for education. So I like thinking about community with collecting as well. Um, at auction, we're a community of specialists and we're always happy to share our information. And I'll kind of jump ahead. There's also your local community. So I'm giving you another plug for the HCP auction and the HCP team, you know, learn about photographs through them. Participate in the auction with me coming up on the 18th. Um, see if you can be successful on any lots. You know, and then there's also the digital and the, the broader global community. There is so much amazing content online, whether it's Instagram, you know, there's the YouTube channel that we sent out with our, our videos. There's so many different ways to engage and learn. I also think within the past year, um, artist talks, you know, being invited to an artist talk is something that maybe I would do once every three months if I was lucky, you know, with, all that I, I'm exposed to here in New York, and I'm sure that you have in Houston as well with HCP, but I could probably listen to an artist speak about their work easily once a week right now because of all of the different uh, ways people are reaching out and engaging with online. Take advantage of it, enjoy it. Um, hearing from an artist about their work is, is always you know, really special. And then the last kind of uh, thing that I want to uh, talk about is, you know, at the beginning of this, I showed the family photo. I talked about thinking about collections and collecting and buying an auction as, you know, 
looking at how a photographer might be seeing their view of the world and how you relate to it um, or how it might uh, push you to learn something new. And what I want to share to just wrap up is a video that we did of a collector at Phillips. His name's Ed Cohen. Um, we sold his collection. Um, and so I'll show you, we did a, a vanity catalog. I still love my auction catalogs. Um, this beautiful Lee Miller, Man Ray on the cover. And Ed was one of those passionate collectors who just loved speaking about why he loved photographs. And so as we think about collecting, it's good to hear from collectors as well. And so we'll, we'll play Ed's video. A lot of contemporary art is, is about what people think is important or what people think is going to be important in history. Whereas in photography, it's very immediate. And for me, there's more meaning. It's about exploring the world. Thomas explores the world in one way. Ajay explores Paris and, and what it meant to him the extraordinary thing about Arbus is that she found all of humanity in New York. She was able to connect across the widest range of people of any artist that I know. So many different aspects of human life and the way people live and the way people present themselves, inspiring you, making you think about how someone else lived their life and what that can tell you about how you live your life. I don't see myself as a collector of photography. I see myself as someone who's always exploring. You know, I've been looking for images of writers and artists and poets for 30 years, and I didn't buy anything that didn't speak to me personally. You know, there's no particular pattern. It has to do with finding an image where the photographer has captured something about the writer or artist that says something about who they are and what they write about. And I feel like having images of writers around me is inspiring. Photographs can be both haunting or elegant or challenging, trying to find the unknown hidden part of a human being to find something beyond our understanding so that we have an image that stays in our mind always. But I admit, it's a mystery. <laughs> Sarah, we have a question from the audience. Um, of course, yeah. They wanted to know, are you a collector? And where, <laughs> who do you col collect by from? Oh, such a good question. Um, so I, I am a, a, I'd say a small time collector, um, but, but I do love photographs and I love surrounding myself by photographs. Um, I, I just moved and I've been bemoaning that I have a lot of white walls right now. But one thing that I did um, I kind of pull out for tonight you know, we get to play with our photographs when we're collectors too, is a Samaletti um, uh, that was done in India. And, and I just love it because we have this, you know, dog kind of, you know, cuddled on a, on a cow taking a nap. But it, it's just, it's such an image of, of India um, that I love. And I also just love the connection between the, the animals. And so there's something about this picture that I just, gravitate to, you know, I, I've never traveled to India. I'd love to travel to India, but I love that image and I love the, the connection in that image. Um, and then this other one, you know, we're talking about what's personal to us with collecting. My grandfather was very much a tinkerer. Um, he, he could fix anything and just kind of had one of those brains that could put things together. Well, he built his own dark room and after he passed away, I, I found photograms that he did of various leaves and botanicals. So I, I have my, my fine art photograph you know, kind of paired with one that's actually a photogram from, from my grandfather. 
Um, I, I just love photographs. You know, I, I think if you're in the industry and you're working in auction, you know, there's something about the, the image that can be captivating. You know, I, 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 I do what I preach. Um, you know, there are a lot of vernacular images that I have because that's where I can collect right now. You know, and then there are a few things that I have that are at a, a higher level. Um, the Samalati is something that I will mention. You know, there's a work coming up, you know, in, in the auction, in the silent auction for HCP. And, you know, there's there's an entryway for photographs, you know, through through any level, if that's participating in our sales and buying something that's $100,000, great. If it's seeing an image uh, and a print by an unknown photographer that enraptures you and you love and makes you think about the world a different way or just makes you smile, go for it, collect it, you know, put it up on your wall and enjoy it. And so I'd say there, there's some, there's some, you know, kind of highs and lows, you know, like that. But I, I thought it would be fun to have these two behind me tonight because I think it speaks to, you know, one, an image that I just love because of the connection. And then also, you know, it, it's a family picture, you know, and it was my grandfather tinkering around with something, but I love that too. So um, collect at any level, just, you know, love the medium and appreciate the medium and, and find something that makes you think about the world a little bit differently maybe. Um, uh, I think you can do that through photographs. Um, and, you know, with Ed, he was someone who also, you know, he was a, a, a writer, a poet, a creative thinker himself, and he, he sought out those images and those portraits in his own collection. And so we have this beautiful Richard Avedon that we sold for him. We have this wonderful Francesca Woodman um, also that we, we sold for him. And um, you know the the man Ray Lee Miller, which was on the cover of our catalog, and I, I like the way that he had that personal connection to collecting, and and I think that you know for for those of us who have the bug, you know, there's usually something that that does drive those those purchases. Um, and let's skip ahead. There's an install image. Um, you know, I, I loved the preview of his collection. And then I'll, I'll leave you with two things, you know, two images to, to maybe inspire all of you. Um, and there's one uh, jumping ahead, a, a Lee Friedlander. Um, a fabulous Texas image, Lone Star image for all of you that I thought was appropriate. Um, you know, Leo Friedlander is one you can buy early prints at one price. You can buy later prints at another price. We offer both in our sales and, and his galleries offer both. And then last but not least, um, since there was one behind me, the, the Samalati that's going to be in the auction, and I anticipate bidding will go so high that some of you will probably have to buy the book. So keep in mind that you can always get such great photo books as well. Um, this being one that I have, and I was excited to see the, the image come up in the sale. So thank you all. I mean, it's just, it's such a treat again to talk about photographs, um, talk about collecting, talk about auction. And, you know, if you have any other questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to address them. We have a couple minutes, so um, don't be shy. If any, anybody has any more questions. And if not, that's okay too. <laughs> Maybe that means we answered everything. <laughs> I just want to say thank you very much. I thought that was great. Very You're welcome. Fun. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think if it's it's one thing that I'd love to leave everyone with tonight is I, I think auctions sometimes can, um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it, people get intimidated by it. Um, I think that it, it should be the opposite, you know, as auction specialists, we're there to answer questions, you know, and as an auctioneer, I really feel like it's, it's my role as auctioneer to make sure that people participating know where the bid is, know what's happening, know what's going on. So 
it's it's an open door and you know I, I welcome anyone to participate and again hopefully we'll have a lot of participation when it comes to our auction on the 18th as well thank uh, you so oh. too late for a question no to, john please please share your question okay i just just kind of wondering in general uh on the attestations of some of the works how much a background research may or may not be done are we taking the seller's word or a commission an agent's word for what this is i know that there's obviously some examination of the piece itself but in terms of you know uh, provenance or whatever how much of that goes into an auction such a good question um, and so the, there's a role within the auction house that's called the cataloger. Um, and it tends to be more of a, a junior staff role. I think it's an amazing role because you're seeing all the objects that are coming in for sale. And when we have any new cataloger that gets trained with us, the first thing I tell them is never assume. Look at every print that is coming in for our sale fresh and never assume that the information we have is correct. You know, as, as specialists, as an auction house, we need to make sure that we are um, using our own expertise. And yes, you know, 85, 90% of the time, you know, the information that we're getting is right, but sometimes there are older records or there's new research um, that's out or, you know, galleries make mistakes too. Maybe there's a print medium on an invoice and we're looking at it and it's actually like, it actually looks like something else, you know? So we are never assuming, we are always being students as well. And if we don't know something, we will ask. And, you know, when it comes to the auction catalog, that brief summary is something that there's a lot of, of, of intentional thought that goes into it to make sure that we're putting forth an accurate description. And sometimes we don't know. You'll see that sometimes there are even print dates where we're seeing print date unknown because if we don't know, we you know we, we we won't assume and we won't we won't give information that we don't know. Sarah, I have another question from the chat. Um, sure. It's about abstract and non-representative photography. Many of your examples were more focused on on you know photos of humans. <laughs> Yes, there is there's a lot of figurative work um, uh, tonight. And so I'm I'm I love this question. You know, I one because it's one of the reasons why, you know, I also love photography. Um, photography is an art medium, it is also a science. And uh, because of that, you are constantly dealing with how the medium progresses, you know, with how artists are are also stretching the boundaries of the medium. And so it's exponential, you know, what the, the, the possibilities are when it comes to photography. You have an artist like Wolfgang Tillmans who has done a figurative work and has also done highly expressive abstract work that breaks down literally how light exposes itself on paper, just like Man Ray did uh, decades ago, you know, in his dark room in Paris. And so whether it's figurative, like the examples I had, or abstract, you know, we are dealing with, um, you know, how artists are pushing the boundaries of the medium. And I think that there is a lot of exciting work right now with contemporary photographers who are, you know, really pushing digital techniques. Um, and also, you know, kind of on the flip side of that, you have a school of photographers who are working in 19th century processes that they're trying to bring back because of that, the hands-on element of making those images. At the end of the day, they're all pictures, they're all photographs, and I think that they show uh, immense creative thought. Um, so at abstract, you know, digital, it is all, all definitely a, a part of the medium and, and a part of the market for us. Thank you. Um, and I just want to step in and say on behalf of, of uh, HCP, you know, I, I hope to see all of you join us for the auction and know that not only is it a chance to maybe start your collection or add to your collection, but when you, you bid on artwork um, in our auction, you're also supporting our organization and our legacy. And so it's our 40th anniversary. And so we're really excited. I think it's a, a fabulous collection of work. 
and um, yeah, when you when you when you bid, you're you're it, it does many things. <laughs> Do we have any last questions before uh, we let our fabulous speaker go? Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for your time and the really thoughtful presentation. I know I learned a lot and I, I, I think in the comments are all very positive as well. So uh, thank you for your time. And again, I hope to see all of you um, bid and, and join us for our celebration of HCP and an auction on February 18th. Wonderful. I will. I have my gavel with me tonight. I am so excited for the auction. So I, I expect to have lots of bidders out there. And, and Shannon, I'm looking forward to it too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Houston Center for Photography exists for and because of our community. If you enjoyed this program, please consider making a gift to our annual fund at www.hcponline.org give. We are especially grateful for your vital support during this unprecedented time. Thank you.